This is episode number 38 of Hitting for the Cycle. That's Ben Cruz. I'm Ryan Tui. And the month of June is coming to a close. We got about a week left of the uh, baseball season before the All-Star break. And Ben, a lot has happened um, over the past uh, week here in uh, Major League Baseball. Yeah, a lot has happened. Um, I've really, ever kind of since the Celtics playoff runs over, that's really been my focus now is back to baseball. And um, yeah, a lot has been going on. You know, last week we, of course, had to talk about some injuries. We had to talk about some of the gambling stuff that, you know, we've pe- talked about in past episodes. But this was just a lot of different stuff. Um, a couple different teams are on the rise. A couple other teams are not as well as on the rise. We'll talk about that. And, um, yeah, crazy to think that June is is almost over. And, uh, you know, the All-Star break is coming up. So that will be coming up soon. And then we got the MLB tread deadline coming up soon. And, you know, halfway of the baseball season will pretty much almost be over. So, or actually, um, halfway through already, um, the all star the all star <laughs> game um it happens actually a little more past eighty one games, and uh, but most teams have already played uh, eighty one games this season so far. So we're actually already halfway through the uh, season, which is crazy to think about. It feels like yesterday we were just talking about spring training, and now here we are in the um, in the summer and uh, we're already uh, halfway through this long uh, treacherous journey through uh, major league baseball season so we got a lot to get into today but before we do we obviously just want to remind everybody to follow hitting for the cycle on facebook x and instagram at hftcetv follow the empty the bench podcast network at etb network be sure to follow our youtube channel at etb network you see the graphic right here down below and finally listen to us on whatever platforms you listen to your podcasts on yeah, this uh, episode to you guys is presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream uh, live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience from playing fantasy sports, rubbing your favorite players and teams, and watching with uh, the commentators and communities you care about, win or lose, sports are best together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB Network to find more about our live stream schedule. Um, make sure just to download the Playback app, and there you go. Follow us on MT Bench Network where you can get all the, the live stream schedule stuff. And, you know, with the basketball season over, um, hopefully we'll get some uh, stuff through you guys pretty soon. All right, so let's get into it. Um, as Ben mentioned, um, some teams are go- going in different directions, and uh, one team that's going in the direction up are the Cleveland Guardians in the American League Central Division. Man, have they been red hot this entire year. They really have not slowed down that much. They have stayed consistent, and right now they currently have the best record in the American League. Um, they are at 51-27 and 27 with an eight-game lead in the American League Central. They did um, have – a seven game winning streak um, that was snapped last night at the hands of the Baltimore Orioles. But um, the guards are not slowing down, as I mentioned. And um, a big reason why is because of Stephen Kwan. Despite missing 26 games, um, Kwan has not lost a beat. And he leads the American League in batting at 377. You can make a pretty good um, bet that he is going to win the American League batting title this year. And he definitely should get some MVP considerations this year. Um, you know, depending on how uh, things work out for Cleveland in the end, I think he should be a top three um, American League um, MVP finalist at, mo- at least um, with the way that he's played this year. You know, even though he's missed um, a good chunk of the season with um, with injury, he still has more than made up for it um, ever since he came back onto the field. And also Cleveland's bullpen has just been elite. They have a 237 Team ERA, which is the best in all of Major League Baseball. Um, only the Do- they are ahead of the Dodgers, who are second at 3.02. Obviously, um, they also have the veteran presence of Jose Ramirez, who's having another respectable season. Um, he has a uh, he's hitting 275 with uh, 21 home runs, which is tied for fourth in the American League, 72 RBIs, and an 870 OPS. So right now, all things are clicking for the uh, guards, and like I mentioned, they got a pretty um, pretty comfortable lead in that uh, AL Central division over uh, Minnesota. Um, The only uh, thing that I would say that they need to work on um, at the trade deadline is to improve that starting rotation. It's pretty thin. Sometimes it can get, um, it can be um, exploited um, when, um, 
when it when it happens, um, they they, uh, they sometimes struggle with their starting pitching. So at the trade deadline, I expect them to try and acquire some moves. I could maybe see them look out and maybe reunite with somebody like Cal Quantrill, who's in uh, Colorado. Maybe they can make a move for him because I don't know if um, the White Sox are going to be willing to deal with the division rival. Um, but, you know, we were talking about Garrett Crochet and possibly where he's going to be going at the uh, deadline. I don't know if he's going to be going to Cleveland necessarily. I just don't know. I don't know if the White Sox want to give um, their top pitching prize to a division rival. But, um, you know, things are looking good for the guards. You know, even though they lost their seven-game winning streak last night, you know, they're still red hot. And they have proven that they are no slouch and they are going to be a dangerous team. You know, they are a team that makes contact. They put the ball in play a lot. They don't strike out. And it shows they're a very tough team to deal with, um, especially with runners on base. They thrive in those situations. They love uh, hitting with uh, men on base. And, um you know, they will strike first um, in those case scenarios and when it comes time. So, um, yeah, there's really not too much to complain about if you're a guards fan. Um, I mean, what have you been impressed with so uh, the most, I would say, when it comes to the Guardians? Yeah, pretty much everything you said. Um, you know, their you know, the rotation, you know, they did not have uh, Shane Bieber. Um, and, you know, Bieber's been one of their better workhorses the last couple of years. Um, you know, they have Tristan McKenzie, who's – kind of been up and down. Uh, they got some other guys, but, you know, I agree with you. You know, their offense has been pretty good. Obviously, Stephen Kwan is a pest. Um, he's somebody that if you're, you know, pitching against, you know, he does not hit a lot of power, but he's somebody that is legitimately like an American League's version of Luis Arise. That's pretty much what he is. He will put the ball in play. He's not going to strike out. Um, he's going to put a, a great at bat every single time that he is up there. Um, and you know, Jose Ramirez is doing his thing. Uh, Josh Naylor, um, both the Naylors are doing really, really well. So, you know, they don't hit a lot for power that, that guards team, but sometimes, you know, you don't have to always rely on the long ball. Um, you know, sometimes you're just a team that'll put the ball in play. Um, they kind of give me some Arizona Diamondbacks vibes, Ryan, of last year. Um, a team that just goes at it, you know, kind of, you know, puts the ball in play and, and really, um, Rick Cabot on the base pass also. So, um, yeah, you know, good good job for the guards. You know, I know that kind of early on the season, you know, we were talking about like every single week with the team, like the guards, wow. Like they're – and now it's not like – they're like for real. And like they're they're going to be a force. Uh, you know, obviously we're kind of talking in terms of the best teams in the American League. We're kind of talking about the, the Yankees for a long time, even though they still are, the Yankees and the Orioles. But now it's like the Guardians are a team that you have to kind of start to, to watch your eye on. Um, especially if they get some pitching in the deadline, which I think they will. Um, like you said, I don't know if um, if Garrett Crochet, they're going to deal with them in uh, in division, but I do think they're going to try to get somebody like maybe like a Luis Severino, um, you know, maybe Sean Manai, maybe they, maybe the Mets kind of unload some guys, maybe the, the Marlins, even though the Marlins are really, really thin curler right now with their injuries. So I do think that, and another thing too, Ryan, you have to take into account. Um, they're doing with the new manager currently, currently as of right now, um, which is pretty impressive because a lot of times, you know, you look at the Astros, you know, for a while at least, they really struggled with their new guy and Espada, and you know they're starting to get things around sadly for us. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no credit to the guards; they've done really, really well. Um, and yeah, they're going to be a really good team, especially if you get some pitching. Yeah, like you mentioned, this is with a, a new manager. I mean, Stephen Vaux was a player just two years ago. He played his last game just two seasons ago with the yeah. Oakland A's. And, you know, he made it clear that he wanted to manage in Major League Baseball. And he gets a chance, you know, pretty quickly after he last played. And this is just a natural, easy transition for him, it seems like. He's having a blast. I think the players really have embraced playing for him this year. I mean, they're going from a Hall of Fame, a future Hall of Fame manager in Terry Francona to a rookie manager, first year manager in Stephen Vo. And this is arguably the best team that Cleveland has had in years, maybe since 1995. Um, I mean, I know Cleveland won 102 games in uh, 2017. They had that 22 game winning streak at the end of the year, but they never really took, they didn't really take off until like the second half of the year and later into the summer when they went on that winning streak. But I'm, I'm talking about in terms of beginning of the year to the end of the year, this might be the strongest team that Cleveland has had 
since their um, American League uh, pennant winning team in 1995 when they won 144 in that abbreviated season because baseball was still on strike at the beginning of that season. So, yeah, the Guardians look good. There's no other way of saying it. They look strong. They look confident. They look hungry. And I think they've been overlooked a lot this season. I don't know. I think they've been overshadowed by teams like the Yankees, like you mentioned, and the uh, the Orioles and the Dodgers. And, um, you know, I think it's time that we start giving credit where credit is due. Where credit is due. Cleveland is uh, Cleveland's a very legitimate threat to uh, win the title this year. And uh, we'll see if they're able to have finally have a very hot deadline. They definitely need some help in that rotation, like we mentioned. But um, this is a very good chance for Cleveland to finally put an end to that curse uh, that's been going on for almost 80 years now at this point. Um, Cleveland obviously hasn't won the World Series since 1948. And um, it's the longest drought. It's the longest active uh, title drought in Major League Baseball right now. And um, we'll see if uh, they're able to make some moves that can help them uh, get them over that uh, hump. But um, we'll see. Um, I do expect Cleveland to um, win this, uh, win the American League Central this year. Um, I think this eight-game deficit is too much for um, any other team in the Central to uh, to overcome. But you never know. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, the Guardians have just been uh, red hot, um, and two other teams have been red hot in the American League, and one you just mentioned. Um, the Houston Astros and the uh, Boston Red Sox, two teams that, as a Yankee fan, I despise with all my heart. So uh, I'm not happy to see this at all. But um, let's start with the uh, – let's start with your Red Sox. The Red Sox have really been playing well. Ever since they took two out of three from uh, Philadelphia, they've just been a completely different team this year. The Red Sox have won 10 of their last 14, including uh, taking series against the Phillies, the Yankees, and the Reds and a sweep of the Blue Jays in Toronto. And, you know, the Red Sox came into this season with not many expectations, but they have completely uh, flipped the switch. It seems like ever since that series against the Phillies uh, at Fenway Park, they've just been a completely different team. And you can see um, in the demeanor of the players now, their hitting has been more aggressive, their base running has been more aggressive, their pitching has been very good. And um, now the Red Sox are putting themselves in a position to fight for a wild card spot this year. And in addition to that, they've also shaved off a couple of games um, for the AL East division lead. Now they're still, you know, a good distance back for the uh, AL East division lead. But, um, but yeah, they're right back into contending for um, a playoff spot. And um, I'm sure as a Red Sox fan, this uh, makes you smile. Yeah, I mean, I obviously don't want to get my hopes up, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, maybe it gives them enticement to start to spend a little bit. Um, you know, Alex Cora said yesterday um, something that I would share, but obviously we're kind of on a, you know, a time clock for sure, kind of for each episode. But he pretty much said in, in essence that, you know, this year I want to get greedy. You know, I want to get over that third ball card and and that's kind of something that I've wanted to kind of see from somebody. And because Cora's kind of been, for the most part, uh, you know, pretty even keel in terms of kind of some of the moves in the last couple of years, um, you know, kind of go with the flow. But this time is just like, well, I'm going to contract here. And, you know, I want to see if this team can make a push, not only to make the playoffs, but to make a push in the playoffs. And I think, you know, with the way that this stretch is kind of going, I, I would actually go with Ryan the Yankees series because, you know, they took the, they took the series against Philly and sometimes with like some very like average teams, like you're going to kind of go into a series and kind of win an upset. But, you know, after the Yankees series and the Philly series of one week, um, yeah, they've, they've just been playing really, really well um, for the most part. You know, the pitching has been pretty solid. I mean, Brian Bayo um, had his worst start um, a couple days ago. Um, but outside of that, you know, you know, Tanner Hogg still continues to, continuing to do his thing, um, getting a really, really good pitching from Kenley Jansen in the back end right now. So that's really, really good, especially if he's a, a trade candidate at the deadline. Um, yeah, and, you know, Devers is obviously hitting really, really well. Um, Tyler O'Neill came back, and, you know, Tyler O'Neill is a massive part of that lineup. Um, I think a lot of people have to kind of understand. Um, he just brings just another power bat to that lineup, and I think that's something that they do need to address, as well as the starting pitching. And back end starter, I think, um, if they're in contention to spend. But um, yeah, yeah, you know they they were kind of in that 500 mix, you know, for the first two months. They would 
kind of be right in that creep of, all right, we'll win a game and then we'll go drop down right to 500. Then they'll lose a game under 500 and they'll go right back to 500. And they'll pretty much be consistent of that. Um, but ever since really the Celtics won the NBA Finals, they have not turned back. They are now um, 43 and, you know, 37. Um, they're 7 and 2 in their last 10 games. Um, they did have a, a rain out yesterday. Um, for some odd reason, Ryan, they started to play the game. Like in the first two innings, it was kind of overcast, but it was really looking like it was dealt to downpour. And it started to downpour, and then they just called it. So they're going to do a day night double header um, in late August when the Blue Jays come back. Uh, so they're doing like a two o'clock resumption of the game that just happened yesterday, and then like the night game. So I don't know why they even started to play it, but that's where they are right now. They split the one and one, I guess, because it was only a three game series. Uh, Toronto took the second game and we took the first game and potentially the best game of the season for us. Um, the Celtics were getting honored at, at the game uh, in the morning of, and then uh, the, the Sox were down six to two. So I'm like, oh boy, you know, they're going to get an awful showing. And then the, the bottom of the seventh, things just kind of started to hit. Um, you know, after Vladimir, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. might have hit the longest home run maybe that I have seen. Um, I mean, apparently, I, get, I don't know if you, in terms of you know kind of the backdrop of the Green Monsters, there's like I'm a massive like, roof it. and stuff. And Vladdy apparently hit it like right on that roof, like the back end of the roof. I mean, the, the thing was an absolute tank. Um, and, yeah, by the way, Isaiah Campbell – Fire him in the sun. Um, the guy is absolutely pre future. I don't even know why he was pitching that point in time. But that's another story for another day. Um, but yeah, they came back. Um, Romy Gonzalez, shout out to Romy. I don't know. I don't think a lot of people know who Romy Gonzalez is, but he tied the game down six to four, <clears throat> tied up at six. Kenley had a one, two, three, ninth, and then Jared Duran, who, by the way, Ryan, he's a, he's a guy that's going to be an all star. Vote him right now. I know you're a Yankee fan. But this guy needs to get all the praise in the world because this guy a couple years ago was the guy that got memed for not running the ball behind him from the Romeo Tapia inside of Parker. That still haunts me to this day. But he has completely turned his overall, not only his energy around, his demeanor around, but just overall his game. Um, he's in for power. He's in for contact. He's putting a lot of pressure on the base pass. He's turned into one of the best players, not only in the Red Sox, but in the American League. Um, and he had a walk-off single. And that pretty much brew then went into a frenzy. It kind of felt like old times, honestly, with that overall kind of vibe. It really felt great because for a while, Fenway looked like it was just half empty. Um, really depressing stuff. But but Monday definitely got me going. Um, and yeah, it's just been a team running that I'm kind of invested to watch right now. Um, you know, it's it's a team where we'll see what happens. I mean, I do hope that things kind of start to um, you know, stay the way it's going right now. But yeah, I'm taking this curler right now. Uh, there's a lot of season left, so there's going to obviously be some bumps in the road. And we'll see if this is kind of an, an anomaly for right now um, with this team. But, man, like, this has been a great run. And uh, we got coming up, we have the Padres. Andrew Bogarts is going to be coming back to his old uh, team, as well as Don Arcel is going to be coming back to Fenway. So it should be really fun overall weekend for the Sox, um, despite that Xander won't be playing, unfortunately, because he's hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the Red Sox, they're playing with house money right now. I mean, they really don't have anything to lose. And like you mentioned, Cora's in a contract year. And uh, I don't blame him for uh, wanting to see how far these guys can go. Why not see, you know, what you got, you know, for the for not only this year, but for the future. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, it kind of reminds me a little bit in a way of the 2017 Yankees who, you know, they weren't really expected to do much going into the season. They just let a lot of these guys sink or swim. And I think that's what the Red Sox should do this this year. Just let these guys sink or swim. Let's see what you got. You know, I mean, what do we have to lose? When nobody picked us at the beginning of the year, let's just yeah. go out and have fun and just, you know, see what we can do. And usually when you have that kind of uh, mentality, you know, guys tend to play looser and they tend to have more fun and they just go out there and give their best. They don't think as much. And it turns and sometimes it can turn out to be, you know, an upset in uh, in, in baseball. You know, we've seen that a bunch of times. So, you know, things are looking good for the Red Sox. Um, D-backs for instance last year in the playoffs. Who yeah. really haven't been the Phillies in the NLCS? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the less pressure you have, you know, the more you play loose and, you know, you just don't think and, it, and things just come more naturally. 
And um, I think that's the case for the Red Sox right now. They're just going out there having fun. And, um, you know, I think if they don't if they don't think about the World Series right now, they just think they just play, you know, I think their mentality is just play one game at a time. Let's just go out and have fun. I think that's the mentality they have to have. Don't think so big right now that the big moments will come later on in the season. Just, um, you know, be where you are. Just embrace where you are right now. And um, eventually more things will come your way um, as the season goes on. But the Red Sox are looking good. And another team that is looking good that I mentioned is the Houston Astros. The Astros are back to 500 for the first time this year. They are 40 and 40. They have won seven in a row. Um, and they are looking like the Astros of old. Um, in addition to that, the Astros, this is this was a portion of the season where the Astros had the chance to really make up a lot of grounds because a lot of the competition that they have faced in uh, recent weeks has not been good at all. Um, besides, with the exception of the Orioles um, at home over the weekend, and they proceeded to sweep the Orioles. And not only did they sweep the Orioles, but for the most part, they clobbered them. The offense completely annihilated them at home, and it gave me um, vibes of you know 2017, 2019, 2022, so on, 2021, so on and so forth. They look like the Astros that everybody knows and hates. Um, mm. And you know, people were wondering when is it going to happen? When is it going to when is it going to happen? Are they going to be able to come back? Well, here you are. Here they are. They're back, whether you like it or not. You know, mm -hmm. I was hoping it wouldn't happen. I was hoping that they would have a down year. But I think, that, like I mentioned, they're back to 500 right now. And um, I don't see them falling back below 500 um, for the rest of the year. I think they're. I think this is the moment that they start to take off. And they picked a good time to take off, too, because not only have they taken advantage of the competition that they face, but the Mariners have been slumping. The Astros are now just four and a half back of the Mariners for first place in the American Ooh. League West. Wow. I remember when the Astros were like 10 games back of the Mariners. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago. It was only like two to three weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. They already mm -hmm. made up six and a half games, or, or five and a half, I guess. They've already made up five and a half games in the American League West. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely crazy. Um, since that Mexico series that they played in, um, the Astros are 33 and 21. And um, only two teams in the American League have uh, better records in that span, which are, ironically, Cleveland and the Yankees. Um, mm. So they are getting themselves right back into the thick of things. And um, now they're only – not only are they four and a half back of the Mariners, they're also just three back in the final American League wildcard spot. So, you know, the Red Sox and the Astros could be fighting for that um, wildcard spot. But um, I think there's a better chance that the Astros could actually win the division than um, win the uh, wild card. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't trust the Mariners that much. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the Mariners are a pretty talented team. But from what I've seen from them recently, they can uh, – I don't know if I they trust that. They're so, they're so inconsistent at the plate. They yeah. strike out way too much. Um, their pitching is pretty good for the most part. You know, they have a good rotation, but that hitting, I don't know if I trust that offense. It's, it's just too streaky for me. And, um, you know, they got the, the, the Mariners desperately, desperately need to get some help at the deadline for that, for that lineup. Um, you know, you can't rely on the long ball forever. You got to put the ball in play. And this Mariner team is just so reliant on the home run ball. They're kind of like the, the Yankees in previous years. They strike out too much and they rely too much on um, the home runs. Mm -hmm. But of uh, the um, Astros, like I mentioned, they've won uh, seven in a row. Um, they have taken um, – they they took uh, all three games against the Orioles at home, and they've beaten the Rockies the past two evenings as well. They crushed them last night seven to one. So, you know, things are looking good for the Astros. And um, maybe uh, Ben Verlander was right. You can never fully count them out. And um, here they are. And um, I think now that they're back into uh, contention, I definitely think you see them being aggressive at the trade deadline and making some moves. So looks like Alex Bregman's going to be playing out the rest of his uh, contract as an Astro. And, um, yeah, uh, I guess uh, watch out of uh, baseball. Here comes here come the big bad Strohs. The inevitable, Ryan, right? We were kind of yeah. waiting in terms of what was going to happen. It was too good to be true.
it was too good to be true. And I kept looking. I, I you know, we were looking at the overall last couple of weeks of the standings. And I'm like, man, like the Astros are kind of starting to creep up a little bit. You know, it's it's kind of like the uh, the meme of uh, the guy that turns around and he's just like, here comes Jolly. And that's oh, the, oh um, uh, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. 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 That's that's to me what I see with the Astros in terms of the team that kind of do like, oh, yeah, remember us? Um, yeah. It's it's unfortunate, I think, for a lot of the league. Um, you know, thankfully the Red Sox are – playing their best baseball right now because if they weren't, the Astros would be currently the team that might be in that third wildcard spot as, we, uh, as we're talking today. But, yeah, you know, Altuve and Bregman, Kyle Tucker's obviously been raking all year. But the biggest thing about the Astros, you know, Ryan, is their starting pitching has done a lot better. Um, you know, Ronald Blanco's really done a, really good right now. I mean, Verlander, obviously, for the most part, has been doing his thing. But, you know, they asked uh, Dana Brown, I think is the GM for them, um, in terms of what their plans are at the deadline. And he pretty much said they're going to be buyers. Um, you know, even if they were like four and a half out or whatever, but they are potentially right now of that wild card spot. You know, if the Astros are going to try to keep making them push, you know, they never were, I think, a team that was going to, you know, sell. So um, regardless of where they're going to be at the time of, you know, the, you know, by the trade deadline, they're going to they're going to spend. Um, you know, maybe they get a first base bat. You know, John Singleton is not great; he's decent. But maybe they go out and get like a Josh Bell. I've always kind of seen like Josh Bell and the Astros for some odd reason be like a great match. Um, you know, he wouldn't cost the massive bank, but I think he'd be a really good fit switch hitter. Um, you know, could really work well for that overall park in Houston. Um, and then maybe another starting pitcher. I do think the Astros maybe need to get one more starting. Uh, pitcher come the deadline, maybe like a Jack Flaherty type of the Tigers kind of keep on falling where they are been. Um, or Garrett Crochet, you know, that could be another one too. Um, you know, if the Astros you now get like a Garrett Crochet, you know, you can really be like, all right, you know, they're, they're mean business um, if they haven't been already. So, yeah, the inevitable happened. We're, we're kind of be like, all right, now's the, now's the time that they're going to keep taking off. And they got the Grimace Mets now this weekend in New York. So, um, that could be a great, great series overall because the Mets have been playing really, really well, even though you probably want to hear what the way that things happen this We're going to talk too. about them in a sec. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that series, you know, maybe a couple weeks ago, you maybe wouldn't have thought it was going to be much of with kind of both teams of where they were at the time. But, um, you know, now at this recording, you know, right at the end of June, this could be a massive series for both teams. Um, you know, it could be a big – be like Astros come in, you know, kind of feel like they hate it again. Because I think for a while, you know, I think people are like, well, they sucked this year, you know, kind of feels great. And now it's like, well, they're kind of back in. And now maybe the, the hate kind of starts to come around because like pretty much a lot of people are now like, really? You know, really going to do this? You know, it's it was almost like it kind of got like a head start. You know, they were kind of being awful. They're like, ha, I got you guys. That's kind of the Astros right now. So, um, yeah, that, you know, credit where credit's due there. They're playing good ball. And and we'll see in terms of if they can keep on taking it up. I agree with you, Ryan. Like you said, I don't think they're going to be slowing anytime soon. I think that, you know, when this team is going, they go. And, you know, as they say, there's an astro there's a train there at the uh, Minute Maid Park. The train will keep going if they keep playing well. Well, I mean, they uh, righted the ship at a good time. You know, sometimes teams right the ship when it's too late. But um, there's still plenty of baseball left to be played this season. And, um, you know, they are starting to get back into the swing of things at a good time. And like I mentioned, the Mariners have been slumping. So um, things are going upwards for the uh, Astros. And, you know, like you mentioned, the uh, pitching ro rotation has been very strong. Um, the rotation since May 22nd has a 2.93 ERA. And um, Hunter Brown has been a revelation this season. Um, he has a 2.20 ERA across uh, 57 and one-third innings. Um, and um, Ronald Blanco, like you mentioned, has been phenomenal this year. Mm -hmm. um, he has this – because, of course, why wouldn't he be? Um, he has the sixth low CRA um, and he in, in all of baseball. That's and um, there's a very good chance that he makes the American League All-Star team as well. Um, that's coming from uh, Chandler Rome of The Athletic. Um, who wrote an article on the Astros are finally at 500, but they don't feel any sense of relief apparently. Um, so, you know, the Astros know what the, the Astros know who they are. They know mm -hmm. what they're, they know what they're capable of. Um, they expect this um, out of themselves. And um, 
yeah, they're going to be a formidable force um, moving forward. And, you know, you were bringing up first base possibilities for them at the trade deadline. Um, one just entered my mind. I don't know if you think it's um, reasonable or not. How about Vlad Jr.? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that would be uh, – like as a rental, though, I, that's the thing. Do they do they want to cost the bank for him? Um, you know, yeah, I, I think it would be kind of nice, you know, if he didn't go there, I think for a lot of people. But uh, that screams Houston Astros in a way of like they really were off the start. Now they're just kind of starting to get their, their fronting wet. And then they get Vlad Jr. and a, like a decent pitcher. And then they start to keep on taking off. and Because um, like you said, the Mariners right now, their lineup is very hit or miss. Um, J-Rod obviously kind of leads their team. And I love J-Rod, but he's just very, very streaky. He's, uh, he's overrated to me, honestly. You know, like a couple of years ago, uh, last year, I remember I was – or the year before, I forget. I think it was like last year. Um, I was saying that, you know, he should get some um, MVP considerations because he was carrying the Mariners. But um, like you mentioned, he's too streaky. I kind of find mm -hmm. him to be overrated a little bit. Yeah. No, no. I, like I said, I, I agree with you in a way. Um, but no, Ron, I could, I could see that. I don't know. Cause if they want to get a couple pieces, I don't know if they want to just break the bank for them. Cause it's going to cost a lot. I mean, Houston to be fair, like, you know, they have, um, really good prospects. So, you know, maybe they just kind of ride the wave there, but if they really want to make this second half push, you know, Vladdy is going to be there. He could be available. P. Alonzo, he could be available. Um, you know, so, but if they want to kind of go with the, like a consolation type of prize and not like the big fish. I think Josh Bell would be a great fit. Yeah, I could see uh, Bell being an Astro. Um, and I think it would cost them a lot less um, than uh, getting somebody like uh, Vlad Jr. But uh, we'll see what they do. Um, the Astros have made some pretty great additions um, to their team at the deadline. Obviously, you know, they've had, they made that trade line that, well, trade deadline um, acquisition a couple of years ago. Um, well, actually, that was at the end of August uh, for Verlander when he first came to the Astros. Um, but, you know, they always got something up their sleeve, I'll say that. Um, and yep. we'll see if the Astros um, overtake the Mariners for the AL West Division lead sometime next month. Um, but, you know, they're back. And it's crazy to think, Ryan, too. I was thinking about it because you guys have already faced the Astros twice and you got them at like the worst, worst time. Imagine the way that you guys are at the currently this time point in time now and this Houston team where they are this point in time now. It's probably completely. It's not the same league. team. It's not the same team that the Yankees faced at the beginning of the year. Mm hmm. Yeah, face. that's baseball for you, Susan, because it, it could just switch like that in a couple months. You could be like the team that you're on top of the world for the first couple months, and then, you know, you could proclaim the season's over the, the, you know, the month after the first two months. So it's baseball. You know, it's a long, long season. And, um, you know, for the Astros, I kind of had that creep in my mind of, like, just never count them out. And, you know, this is why. I mean, yeah, I mean, the Yankees – you know, dominated the Astros this season in the head-to-head -head matchups. They took six of seven. But um, I'll tell you this right now, if they were to face each other um, in a best-of-seven series right here, right now, i take the Astros easily. And I think most people would, um, considering um, how uh, the Astros have been playing and uh, how the Yankees have been playing. So why don't we get into that? Why don't we talk about the Yankees right now? Uh, the Yankees have been playing their worst baseball of the season by far um, over mm -hmm. the past couple of weeks, really dating back to the Fenway series. Um, they are 2-8 and eight in their last 10. They mm -hmm. have lost three in a row, and um, things are not looking good in the Bronx right now. There have been um, a lot of injuries going on around the, the team. Anthony Rizzo's down. Giancarlo Stanton um, is on his uh, yearly IL stint with another hamstring injury. The mm -hmm. guy's hamstrings are made of noodles. They cannot hold up at all. It is absolutely infuriating how mm -hmm. this man cannot run the bases. For a guy who's in such amazing physical shape, yeah. a, a specimen of physique, cannot <laughs> run the bases. It's absolutely astonishing. And yeah. I, I, looked at, I was watching the game at the time, and I'm like, how is he hurt? He was legitimately running the bases. He was maybe running at 60 maybe 55% around the bases and that still was too much for his hammies to take and they blew out on him like a car tire so it's absolutely just 
it's not surprising. I really, it's not surprising at all because yeah. I'm used to this at this point now. Mm -hmm. uh, and as every year passes, it look, the contract just looks worse and worse and worse. Oh God. It's just been, a, it's, it's been tough. I love Stan. He's a class act all the way, but my God, the guy can't stay healthy to save his life. Mm. And, um, you know, that was this goal to stay healthy for a full season. And I've come to the conclusion that after this season, no matter what, no matter what he does, he can go under the most strict training diet regimen you can possibly imagine. It doesn't make a difference. He will not be able to stay healthy for a full season. It's just not going to happen. The only yeah. way I think he could stay healthy is if you give him an IL stint no matter what at some point during the season, even if he's not hurt. Mm -hmm. Like just put him down, sit him for two weeks, do not play him because inevitably his body's going to, go out on him at some point. Even with that, he'll probably get hurt. So. Even with that, he'll probably get hurt. Then it'll be a month-long IL stint. Mm. But, um, yeah, he's hurt. Rizzo, obviously, is dealing with a, with a fracture in his uh, arm that he suffered during that uh, tumble at Fenway a couple yep. of weeks ago. So he's out. The Yankees called up Ben Rice from uh, AAA, who actually has uh, played pretty good for the most part. Um, he's got mm -hmm. a nice swing. Um, that's tailor-made for Yankee Stadium. I just hope this isn't uh, Greg Bird uh, Part 2 where the guy goes off um, when he gets called up and then does nothing afterward. Um, and also uh, doesn't stay healthy either because Bird mm. was also made of glass. He was probably the most injury-prone player I ever saw um, in my entire life. And that says something considering how many injury-prone players the Yankees have had over the years. But um, the Yankees have not been playing well at all. They played the Mets in the Subway Series, the first half of the Subway Series, the past two nights. Um, and they got absolutely embarrassed um, in both games. And um, there have just been a lot of players struggling. The Yankees have been heavily reliant on the top three in that order, that being um, Anthony Volpe, Juan Soto, and Aaron Judge. The Yankees got Juan Soto specifically to help um, to help out Aaron Judge. But, um, you know, two players don't necessarily make a team. Nine players make a team. And uh, the four through nine hitters for the Yankees over the past couple of uh, games have done absolutely nothing, basically. Um, and it's gotten to the point where some guys are on the bench. And, um, yes, I'm talking about Glaber Torres. Torres, we, we brought, I mentioned in last week's episode um, how he struck out in, uh, at Fenway Park um, with the bases loaded with uh, nobody out. He did the same thing on, a, on, Monday, on a Tuesday night against the Mets. The Yankees threatened um, right away against um, – I forget who was on the mound for the Mets in uh, game one. Peterson. Uh, who? David Peterson. Not Peterson. Yankees load the bases with nobody out, and uh, Glaber Torres is at the plate. For some reason, Aaron Boone had him batting cleanup in this game, despite the fact that Torres has just had a nightmare season. And yeah. Torres just tried to kill the ball. That's basically what he tried to do. He was trying to hit a grand slam and chased one out of the strike zone and struck out. And mm -hmm. that just led to the downfall. Verdugo struck out, and then after Verdugo struck out, J.D. Davis, another acquisition that the Yankees made recently from the Oakland A's. Yep. If you're DFA from the Oakland A's, that says something about you. <laughs> Davis struck out, and the Yankees for the second time in less than, I think, two weeks? I think, yeah. For the second That's time, impressive. For That's the second time in less than two weeks didn't score a run after starting off an inning with the bases loaded. They did it at Fenway and they did it at City Field. Two places that just haunt the Yankees and their fans, basically. And it's gotten to the point now where Torres is on the bench. Torres has just had a horrible year. And mm. he's down, I think, last time I checked, I think he's down to like 212 or 215 this season. Yeah, I think he's like around that. I checked uh, last night. He's around that. Yeah, that's his batting average right now. Mm. And not only that, this is this is also amazing. He has not had a multi-hit game since May 26th. He hasn't had he hasn't had two hits in a game since in over a month now. That's crazy. And he got benched um, not only because he not only because he's been struggling at the plate. He also didn't run out another ground ball um, yeah. in the eighth That's inning in the so first bad. game. Mm -hmm. He said that he was having tightness in his groin. I'm sure he is dealing with tightness in his groin. But still, like, dude, you've done nothing this year. At least mm -hmm. try to look good. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only are you not looking good hitting, you're not looking good in the field either. He made another error yesterday on Monday on Monday night or Tuesday night. I keep, I, yeah, he made another error on Tuesday night. Well, I think that's error. Sure. I think that's error number twelve on the season for Torres. 
We're not even through June yet, and he's already made 12 errors on the season. Torres is the worst fielder I've ever seen, easily. I mean, the way he turns his glove when he charges a ball, he charges it backhand, and he <laughs> He's so nonchalant. Like, that's the thing with him. He tries, to be, time- he tries to be Robinson Cano. Say what you that's want exactly. about Cano. He say what you want about Cano. I mean, I said a lot about Cano too. Trust me, I called him out for being lazy and nonchalant at times. But the thing, but the difference between Cano and Torres is Cano actually backed it up most of the time. Mm-hmm. Torres doesn't, and it's just amazing how you know Torres. Torres is 27 years old. He's in the prime of his career. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to fall off this dramatically at 27. This mm-hmm. is a fall off of this magnitude happens when you're 37. Or you know you're getting closer to your 40s. Yeah, it's amazing how bad he's been. And you know he, you know he told the press a couple of days ago, you know that you know that this has been a horrible year for him, obviously. And um, Boone said he's made too many errors. Those mistakes certainly are a part of the story of his season so far. They're not injury related, according to Boone. That being his injury, that being his defense um, and his errors. But I mean. You know, I watched him. I remember really going back from the very first series of the season against Houston. Torres has never looked good. Like he has not looked good at all this whole year. I've watched. I've watched almost every single game this year for a little bit, and just some of the swings he's he's been taking. He he's not even moving his legs in the batter's box. He's just like flailing the bat. I have no idea what's going on through his head. Maybe mm-hmm. it's the pressure of this being a contract year for him and everybody's talking about Juan Soto be, um, extensions and how nobody's talking about him. You know, I just, I don't know what it is with him. I, it's definitely, I think it's definitely mental more than anything else. I just don't see a guy who is, whose head's in the game. I just see somebody who's uh, just off in La La Land <laughs> thinking about other things. And you know the camera, the yes cameras um, panned to Torres in the dugout last night. Mm-hmm. He looked like he was in jail. He looked so depressed. It looked like a mugshot almost. I was gonna say it looked like like his dog died. <laughs> like he had the biggest frown on his face. And you know, if you're the Yankees right now, you know you're you're barely barely hanging on to first place in the AL East. You're hanging on by a threat at this point. The only reason you still have the lead in the AL East is because the Orioles have actually have been struggling recently. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Orioles actually have kind of been shooting themselves in the foot a little bit, not taking advantage of the Yankees' struggles. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason you're still in first place. But if you're the Yankees here, you really need to consider moving Torres at the deadline. There's really no ifs, sands, or ups or up or butts about it. This might be the only year you have Soto. You've come this far, and Torres is hurting you. He's not helping you. You really need to consider moving him. You can't keep playing. I mean, Torres has had enough time to try and fit and write the ship this year. It's June 27th, and he has not been able to figure it out. And by the way things are going for him this year, I don't see him figuring it out. So if I'm the Yankees, you, I really need to think you got to let him go at the deadline. There's just There's no other way about it. And he's not the only one who needs to be let go. DJ LeMayhew, long overdue. It's time to cut the cord with DJ. And I love DJ. I, I, he was one of my favorite players for a number of seasons. But he's nowhere near the type of player he was in 2019 and 2020. He's done. He's cooked. He's an overcooked steak at this point. And he just cannot figure out how to hit a baseball anymore. Every time he comes to the plate, it's a ground ball to third, ground ball to short, ground ball to third, ground ball to short. Mm-hmm. He had a pathetic at bat to end the game on Tuesday nights, where he struck out on three pitches too. That's mm-hmm. the kind of at bat he wouldn't make if it was like 2019 or 2020. But this is 2024. DJ Lemayhew, he's a th- he's 36 years old. He's not a spring chicken anymore. Mm-hmm. And I know the I know he still has I think two more years left on his contract. Oof. But you know what? You cut Aaron Hicks last year when he still had two more years left on his contract. I think you got to cut. I got you got to do the same with DJ. And it sucks too that he's going to be un- that he that I'm calling for him to be unceremoniously booted to the curb, but um, it's time. He's not helping this team at all either. He's been horrible, and um, so those two are addition by subtraction, if you ask me. But they're not the only two. Alex Verdugo, your boy, is in an absolutely pathetically horrible slump, and not only that, he cannot stop grounding into double plays. <laughs> It's amazing. 
he's the last guy who I want to see right now come up with the bases loaded because I know he's going to grind into a double play, and he did it twice more last night. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I think Verdugo's a solid ball player, but my God, when he struggles, he struggles. He's It's, it's been bad. He fi- I mean, he at least snapped an 0 for 20 skid last I night. Gonna, I was going to say, Ryan, you have at least you have this. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and then he and then he comes through. Then he comes through. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the Yankee offense has been really bad recently. Their pitching hasn't been much better either. Their pitching's been mm. slump, their pitching's been pretty bad too. Garrett Cole threw meatballs on Tuesday night in the second start of the season since coming back from the uh, injured list. The, the Mets just made him look like a made him look like a Triple A pitcher basically. Like he just came up from uh, triple, made him up, come up from Triple A, and the Yankees do what they do best: give up home runs to ex teammates. Harrison Bader torched them um, a couple Bader. of times this year. Bader. He, he <laughs> Bader killed them this this week, mm-hmm. absolutely destroyed them. That's what the Yankees do: they make um, their old teammates look like Barry Bonds. Um, that's <laughs> they're the masters at that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, it's not looking good for the Yankees, and you know, fortunately for them, they got off to a hot start. So, you know, I mean, I knew, look, a baseball season is very long. Every team is going to go through some kind of skit at some point yeah. this year. I knew the Yankees were not going to keep up. We're not going to keep up the pace that they were uh, winning at. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to start getting into the habit of losing like this because this is what happened uh, in 2022 in the second half. And this is what happened last year. And the Yankees were never able to recover from this. Now, the trade deadlines in a couple of weeks and the Yankees really have some tough decisions to make as loyal, as much as, as they are yeah. on certain players and how, as you know, as defensive as they have been to some players, you know, this is a business at the end of the day, you know, businesses fire employees, you know, lay them off when they're not able to afford them or they just have been doing a bad job at their, at their positions. And some Yankees have not been doing a good job have not been good at their jobs for a while now. The Yankees need to cut the cord with DJ LeMayhew. It's overdue. He's not going to figure it out. And it sucks to say, cause I really do love DJ and Torres is just not mentally tough enough to uh, win a world series as a Yankee, in my opinion. And, um, you know, they really could use another arm or two at the deadline because, you know, Cole, just got embarrassed in probably what was his worst start as a Yankee. Um, yeah, I'd probably say that. In a regular season game. His worst start is the wild card game in 21 overall. But mm-hmm. in a regular season game, this that was probably his worst start as a Yankee. And, um, you know, Clark Schmidt's not going to come back till September, and you don't know what you're going to get out of him when he comes back. Luis Hill looks like he's starting to get tired. Um, he mm-hmm. didn't look good last night either. He's starting to give up home runs more and more. Where Don um, also is starting to come well, Don does not look good. The only guy who, the only guys who have looked pretty good from st- who have been consistent have been Cortez and Stroman. But mm-hmm. um, that's true. Was the one that was struggling. He was the wor- he was the guy that really struggled. So he's yeah, kind of figuring Nestor out was struggling at the beginning of the season, but he's kind of picked it up over the past couple of weeks. He pitched great against Atlanta um, a mm-hmm. couple of days ago. Uh, the only reason he was the losing pitcher in that game is because the offense didn't help him out. And um, Strom has been very good. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, the Yankees uh, the Yankees need to be aggressive at the deadline. You can't be uh, dilly-dallying um, or whatever the hell you, that phrase is called. But No, no, you got it. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you can't be – but, yeah. Um, the Yankees have been slumping right now. Um, if there was any team that could use the all-star break, I think it's them. A lot of these guys just look tired and um, – drained um and i think i think torres definitely needs at least four to five games on the bench he should not he should not be playing the field at all he should not be playing at all in this toronto series that the yankees have coming up the yankees to be fair have had a pretty tough stretch of games they've had some tough competition i mean they had the royals they had the red Sox, they had the braves they had the mets and a lot of these teams were playing their best baseball of the entire season going into these series now, that's not necessarily an excuse for the Yankees to crap the bed as bad as they have been over the past couple of weeks, but yep. it hasn't necessarily been the easiest schedule that they've had to deal with either. But this weekend, they have a big four-game set in Toronto against the Blue Jays, who are not a good team at all. Got to take at least three or four against the Blue Jays in this series, at least three or four. And um, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, the Yankee offense, 
has just been really, really bad. It's like it's looking like 2023 all over again. It's relying too much on Judge. It's relying too much on Soto. Yankees got to pick it up. Some guys really need to break it up. Hopefully, you know, getting those two hits. Hopefully, Verdugo starts putting it together because he can't keep playing like this. And, um, you know, I just I have no faith in Torres or LeMahieu anymore. I don't want to see them on the field anymore. I want the Yankees to keep running Oswaldo Cabrera and Ben Rice out on the field. Um, if you want to platoon those guys, you know, find somebody at the deadline um, to platoon with them. But because Torres and LeMahieu are just not worthy platoon players, J.D. Davis is not a worthy platoon player. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see. But the Yankees are in a pretty bad funk right now. And um, I want to stick on the Mets because they actually have been playing some very, very good baseball. They're back to uh, 500. I think they're at 39 and 39 right now. And um, But there was some drama um, with the Mets at the beginning of the week um, in a uh, Sunday night game, Sunday night baseball game against the uh, Chicago Cubs. Um, closer Edwin Diaz um, was ejected for uh, foreign substance use um, before he was even able to throw a pitch. And um, he, as a result, he's been suspended for 10 games. And um, Carlos Mendoza, the Met manager, actually um, wasn't too defensive of uh, Diaz in the post games. He was basically saying, no, he was wrong, um, and uh, the rules are the rules, and we need to abide by them, and hopefully he doesn't do that again. That was basically what Mendoza had to say regarding Diaz. So, um, yeah, I mean, but the whole thing with um, foreign substance, you know, it's so hit or miss for me. I mean, inevitably, when you when the play, when the pitchers pick up the rosin bag, and they sweat, especially in this in this humidity that we've been having here. Inevitably, it's going to lead to something on the hands. Like, what's the point of having a rosin bag at that point, especially in the thick of summer? You know, the whole thing with the foreign substances with the pitchers is just is so strict now. I mean, if it's pine tar, then I understand. But if it's something like sweat and rosin, like, then why have the bag out there in the first place? Or at least give them a towel or something. I don't know. Like, the whole thing is just so stupid to me. But the Mets have been playing very good baseball. Um, and like you mentioned, they are um, going to be set for a pretty big uh, four games. Or not four games. They're set for a pretty big series against the Astros this weekend. Um, in regards to um, in regards to um, Diaz uh, getting ejected, the umpire, Vic Carapaza, told the reporter it definitely wasn't sweat and rosin. We checked thousands of these. I know what that feeling is like. This was very sticky. All right, well, I'm not Vic Carapaza. I wasn't on the mound. So, um, but still, like, I don't, I don't know. The whole thing is just ridiculous to me at this point. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it. Well, it's a sticky situation, Ron, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, no pun intended. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I was watching the game. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, in between innings, they always check these players. And so, you know, they had the camera on Edwin. You know, I was just assuming it was just because he was coming on to pitch. And then, you know, they had an umpire with him, you know, at that point in time. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe they're just kind of double checking some things. And then Edwin started to walk off the mound. I'm like, oh, like something's going on. Like maybe he just was hurt. He just wasn't feeling something in between pitches and stuff like that. But no, like um, uh, the I forgot who was the announcer. Um, John Shambi, I think his name is. Um, Something like that. But regardless of the fact, um, yeah, he uh, he got caught. And, uh, you know, Edwin's never really kind of been a guy like that that's had, like, issues in the past um, with something like that. So it was just kind of crazy to think. I mean, I did see some, like, pictures and stuff. Like, you know, his hands did have some, like, stuff on it. Like, I'm not going to – I'm not going to deny it. But um, I don't know. I just think it's very – it's a sticky situation. Like I said, you know, I think with some guys, you know, they want to say they get away with it, but I think they've been probably trying to be like, all right, you know, like maybe it might be a little too much. Like we'll kind of let it be at least for now, but like, you know, we see it happen again, you know, with you just, you know, we're going to kick you out. Um, but I think with some guys, you know, they just don't play any mind games with, you know, they kind of look at it and they're like, yeah, you're a star player. And, you know, Edwin's one of the best clothes in the game and they kind of saw some with him and they're like, no, we're not going to take, um, any chances and boom, you're out. So, um, yeah, the Mets, obviously their bullpen and this kind of the stretch has been kind of thin, you know, Drew Smith just went on the IO yesterday. Um, Jake Diekman has been very hit or miss. So the Mets really, 
I know it's only 10 games, but, you know, they uh, – and one of the games against the Yankees, uh, they had a commanding 9-2 lead or something yeah, like that. And they, yeah, it was 9-2. They gave up a grand slam. Uh, it's Aaron Judge to make this from a non, you know, interesting game to an interesting game all of a sudden. Um, Adovino has been very hit or miss. He's just kind of been that way for so long. Um, I was watching the Mets broadcast last night, and they're saying, you want to hear a crazy stat, Ryan, is actually Adovino's ERA after a back-to-back start, he has like a nine-plus ERA. Adovino mm-hmm. does. So, yeah, just the Mets really, I think, you know, they just miss his presence. Um, and, uh, you know, I bet he was very eager to face the Yankees this week. And it just kind of sucks that, that this happened to him, but you know, he's going to take the consequences. He's not going to appeal it. It's only 10 games. It's not like it's a couple months. It could have been, could have been a lot worse. Could have been even a couple of weeks. Um, but you know, he's taking the, the consequence and shit happens. Yeah. Um, I think you said it best. Um, it does happen. And, and I, I, you know, obviously the Mets could use some help in that bullpen, especially since they've been playing so well um, recently. So, um, but it's only 10 games, like you mentioned. So um, he's already, I think, halfway through the suspension, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. So just set it out for a couple more games. Um, Diaz also received an undisclosed fine for um, for the foreign substance. Um, I don't know how much he owed, but um, I can guess it was a couple of uh, thousand dollars at least. Probably like five. Probably something like that. But, uh, yeah, that was um, an interesting scenario. But the Mets, regardless, have just been playing well. This is the best baseball that they've been playing all year. Grimace. You have the Grimace Mets. By the way, did you see that gr- there was a Grimace costume during the week? They're all over the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. During the rain delay, there was a photo of all these Met fans taking a photo of the Grimace costume. This this woman, I think, um, put it on Twitter. I think she's like, yeah, I was the person that was Grimace, um, the person from the <clears throat> from the seven line. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, they're just kind of riding a wave. You know, they've had – the Mets have kind of had some really interesting type of stories in the past, you know, with kind of their hot streaks. Um, this, is, this is really one of them. But we'll see. I mean, if they – if they um, beat the Astros this week, this weekend specifically, because it's a really red hot Houston team, um, you know that National League rank currently right now that wild card. We'll talk about the around the league very very shortly. Um, outside of two teams currently that are pretty much going to be the Rockies, um, you know, and I'm trying to think the Mullen Marlins. That's right. Um, everybody else is pretty much there, like for a wild card at least, which is crazy because just everybody. Typically, you don't only have just two teams that are out. Most of the time, you have maybe four or five teams, but in this case, two. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Well, we'll quickly go around the league because we're running out of time here. So, in the American League East, the Yankees leading by a thread, 52 and 30. They are 2 and 8 in their last 10. They've lost three in a row. Orioles are right on their tail at 50 and 30. Your Red Sox are in third at 43 and 37. Eight games back, um, slowly creeping up there. Um, Tampa is 40 and 41. They've actually been playing a little bit better recently. Um, we'll see if they can turn it around, um, you know, in the coming weeks and the blue Jays, I would say are pretty much out of it. Um, they're 36 and 43 and they're in last place. Um, they're just, they're not that good. If you ask me, I don't see them getting good anytime soon. I think they're going to be sellers. Mm -hmm. Um, AL central, as we mentioned, Cleveland first place, 51 and 27 been red hot all year, Minnesota, eight games back, but still respectable 44 and 36. Kansas City um, still struggling, 44 and 38. They've been three and seven in their last ten. Kansas City has not been playing well uh, recently. The Tigers are in fourth place, 37 and 43, and then the god awful White Sox at 21 and 61. 61 losses before the end of June. Oh. They've lost four in a row. I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> Amazing. American League West Mariners lead the charge with the 46 and 37 record. Um, they have they are four and six in their last ten, so they've been struggling as we mentioned. Astros, as we mentioned, back at 540 and 40, second place, just four and a half back. The defending world champion Rangers continue to look anything like world champions this season. 37 and 43. Their pitching is god awful. Their mm-hmm. pitching is god awful, and their hitting's not much better either. Um, fourth place are the Angels, 33 and 46. And then in last place, of course, are the Pathetic Athletics at 29 and 54. They've lost five in a row for what seems like the thousandth time this season. 
<laughs> Remember last week when I said the A's won two games in a row for like the first time in over a month or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, well, they made sure to flush that good feeling down the toilet pretty quickly. <laughs> and in the National League, National League East, Phillies lead at 53-27. and 27. Very comfortable mm-hmm. lead for them in that division. The Braves have been playing a little bit better. Um, they're 44-34, and 34, 10 games over 500, but still too far back for the Phillies um, in the National League East. The Mets, as we mentioned, have been playing red hot, one of the hottest teams in baseball. They're at 539 and 39. Man, what an intriguing matchup they have against the Astros this week. Mm-hmm. This, this week. And two teams that have righted the ship and are back to 500, looking to keep the momentum rolling. But um, it's, yeah. about, it's a three game set. One team is only going to be able to win two games, at least. So we'll see which team that is. And we'll see if um, both teams are able to keep it up um, after this weekend. So we'll see whose momentum, fault, whose momentum suffers a little bit here. And then in fourth place are the Nationals, 38 and 42. And then in last place are the Marlins, of course, at 28 and 52. And the American League Central, Brewers lead the charge. They've won four in a row. They're 48 and 33. The Cardinals have been playing some very good baseball, and they're yeah. back over 500. They're 41 and 38. Look at the Cardinals go. Finally, mm-hmm. it's, it's nice seeing um, St. Louis back over 500. feels like what's been an eternity, even though it's only been about a, a year. The Pirates are in third place at 39 and 41. The Reds are in fourth place at 37 and 43. They've lost two. And then the Cubs, who have been playing some really bad baseball, have dropped to last place in the in the Central at 37 and 44. They've lost four in a row. Maybe you should have stayed in Milwaukee, Craig. And then in uh, lat- and then finally is the National League West. Dodgers, of course, lead the charge, 51 and 31, eight and a half game lead. Um, they're going to run away with the division. The Padres have been playing some pretty good baseball. They're 44 and 41. They've won three in a row. Diamondbacks have been too inconsistent. They're mid, 39 and 41. Giants, 39 and 42. They've won three in a row, um, but they're still 11 and a half back. And then, of course, are the stupid Rockies in last place at 27 and 53. They continue to get hit by the avalanche that is known as themselves. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's where baseball stands as of this day, June 27th, 2024. Um, National League, it's nice to see some teams finally start to get over 500. Yeah. I was really starting to get nervous that there were going to be some under 500 playoff teams. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, hopefully some teams are able to keep it up. But uh, we're kind of out of time here. Um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning into this episode of Hitting for the Cycle. Um, and, yeah, I think next week will be our last episode of the first half of the 2024 season before the All-Star break. Um, but until then, on behalf of Ben Cruz, I'm Ryan Tui. We'll see you then.